I first recommend that for people who have not yet watched my coverage on the mevalinate pathway, watch it first. If you are already done with that, then let's proceed. Here, we will be talking about ketogenesis and a little clinical implication for that, especially for diabetics. And also probably something about the ketogenic diet because a few years ago, it has been some kind of fat. Lately, it has died down. I don't know if it will come back again. Now, first, we have to remember that, again, we could imagine glucose being converted to pyruvate in the cytosol by glycolysis. And then, under aerobic conditions, this pyruvate molecule will be converted in the mitochondrion into acetyl-CoA. Now, it is possible, whether or both in the fed or fasted state, that you could have excess levels of acetyl-CoA. And in my discussion of the mevalinate pathway, I did mention that if you have excess acetyl-CoA in the fed state, what will happen to this is it will first become citrate and then it will be transported out to the cytosol. That is, under the fed state. But now, let us imagine what would happen to the excess acetyl-CoA molecules under the fasted state. And first, you might ask, is it even possible to have so much acetyl-CoA molecules in the fasted state? Remember this. When we were talking about the fed state before, it is really possible for you to have so, 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 so many acetyl-CoA molecules because if you eat a lot, especially so much glucose, that excess glucose levels would actually be the trigger for you to have excess acetyl-CoA molecules. And then some people, especially the sharp ones, would probably ask, hey, in the fasted state, your glucose levels are low. So that means you cannot possibly have excess acetyl-CoA from glucose, right? For those who have not yet realized that, I hope you also realize that now. So now the problem is, where do we get the excess acetyl-CoA in the fasted state? And the answer is the fatty acids. Remember this, isn't it that in the fasted state, that's also the same time that beta oxidation will take place? And remember, fatty acids can give you very, very, very many molecules of acetyl-CoA. Just to give you a perspective, one molecule of glucose will give you two molecules of acetyl-CoA, right? But a single palmitic acid, 16 carbons, will give you it right away. So that tells us that the excess acetyl-CoA in the fasted state would actually be the result of us burning our fats. Indeed, some of those will be converted to energy, and uh, truthfully, that is the purpose of uh, of beta oxidation, right? When we are in the fasted, we have energy deficit. We try to make up for it by burning our fats. And I've discussed that in a previous recording. But do note that some acetyl-CoA molecules cannot anymore enter the Krebs cycle because they are way, 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 way too many. So now, given that, yeah, sure, we have many acetyl-CoA molecules from beta oxidation. Many of those become ATP. Problem solved. We now solve the energy problem in the fasted state. What now happens to the excess acetyl-CoA molecules that cannot anymore be used in the Krebs cycle because the cycle is saturated? The answer is, those excess acetyl-CoA molecules will just be converted inside the mitochondrion into HMG-CoA. So it's like the acetyl-CoA molecules have nowhere to go, then they start uh, combining with each other. Remember in my previous discussion, I told you we need three molecules of acetyl to become HMG-CoA. Thus, we now produce mitochondrial HMG-CoA, which is different from the cytosolic HMG-CoA in the mevalinate pathway. Because as you can clearly see, the enzyme that will act on this is different. Because in the cytoplasm, the enzyme that acts on HMG-CoA is HMG-CoA reductase. But in the matrix, the enzyme that will instead act is HMG-CoA lyase. So be careful with these two enzymes because this will dictate the pathway we have. If it's reductase, welcome to the mevalinate pathway. But if it's lyase, welcome to ketogenesis. And the first product that we form is acetoacetate, which is actually one of the three KBs, or ketone bodies. 
this is not the only ketone body that's why i said it's the first one because we have two more and uh, although I didn't in anymore indicate the specific enzyme name, it is just, just take note that it is possible for acetoacetate to become beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetone. So you can consider this as some kind of triad, our three KBs or ketone bodies. And now, we have to realize that the reason why we need ketone bodies in the first place is maybe, quote-unquote, we can consider this as emergency source of energy. You see, the process of beta oxidation is not really very fast because you first need to cleave molecules of acetyl-CoA, right? And then you have to first feed it to the Krebs cycle. And remember that you must first undergo the electron transport chain to generate energy. If you use actually this, this would be rather faster. So this will try to make up for uh, the M, like the, 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 the temporary uh, deficiency in the body during the time that you are still waiting for energy from other sources. Not only that, particularly the brain has much need for the ketone bodies. Why? Because, think about it, what is normally your energy source when you are in the fed state? Glucose, right? However, remember, we are now discussing a person in the fasted state so glucose is out of the question what's the next best option of course i did mention before that if glucose is low it's time to shine for our fatty acids and indeed most of our body would now be utilizing those fatty acids when we are starving but fatty acids cannot be utilized as energy sources of the brain thus it's just like our brain has ran out of options. And you know how important a brain the brain is, right? Even if you don't know much about neurology, we know how important our brain is. Thus, if we cannot rely on both glucose and fatty acids for energy during starvation, we have to rely on other sources. And come in our ketone bodies. Without this, our brain would be very much at risk of suffering from damage and extreme energy deficit in the fasted state, and no one would ever want that. So given that, you should know that ketone bodies are part and parcel of our body's normal response when we are starving or in the fasted state. Thus, it is not really scary to imagine that when we are fasting, we would have a rise in ketones. That's why we hear of words like ketonemia, which means the presence of ketones or detectable presence of ketones in the blood, and ketonuria, which is detectable presence of ketones in the urine. However, this now becomes problematic if there is an excess amount of ketone bodies. For people without diabetes, this is very rare to take place, but do note that in people with diabetes mellitus, especially type 1, the accumulation of excess ketone bodies is more likely. Why is that? As you see here, the glucagon and insulin hormones actually have a say in regulating our synthesis of ketone bodies. That is, glucagon, just like the enzyme that it, uh, just like the hormone that it works during fasted states, would promote ketogenesis. But insulin would inhibit ketogenesis. Thus, there's an inverse relationship between insulin and ketones. That is, a lot of insulin means low ketones, or low insulin means a lot of ketones. Now, remember, if a person has diabetes mellitus 1, just to contrast it for, uh, from diabetes type 2, a person has low, very low insulin levels, or in fact, none at all. Okay? And thus, that makes sense that for people with DM type 1, their primary treatment is insulin, insulin shots. Thus, if you give a person insulin shots, their insulin would come up because of that injection. Uh, it's an exogenous source, so to speak, and that would be enough to control their diabetes. Now, if the insulin dose is missed, and this is actually more of a real-life problem, it is really the case that some people with DM1 forget to give their themselves their dose of, of insulin, or if it's another pe person, that person may also forget. It is possible that for a short moment in time, the diabetes mellitus would be uncontrolled. 
And remember that if a person has uncontrolled diabetes, his or her insulin levels are low. What if it becomes extended for more hours that the person's insulin levels would become extremely low? Oh, that's an inverse relationship, right? That means that if a person's insulin is very, very, very low, then the ketone bodies must be very, very, very high. And remember, acetoacetates, this is an acid, right? Because this is just other another way of calling acetoacetic acid. And this is beta-hydroxybutyric acid. Two out of three ketone bodies are weak acids. And although our blood could, you know, prevent the uh, uh, lowering of the pH because of its natural buffer system, if there are way too much of these two acids, just like in people with uncontrolled diabetes, we could reach a point where we have what we call ketoacidosis. The blood has become acidic because of the explosion of the numbers of ketone bodies. And because we normally encounter this from uncontrolled diabetes, we normally call this diabetic ketoacidosis, abbreviated as DKA. This explains why if, for example, you are in a medical or a healthcare course, you have read that DKA is a complication of uncontrolled diabetes. I do hope that you understand now why that is the case. Because of the intrinsic relationship of insulin and its regulation of the ketogenetic pathway.